Yes, Your Holiness, thank you so much for hosting this, the 27th Mind and Life Dialogue. We've done this now for many years. We thought it would be appropriate if you'd like to begin to open this session on craving, desire, and addiction with a few words of your own, and then I will follow on your good example. Craving, desire, and addiction. His Holiness is asking how the monastics who don't follow in Tibetan follow What do you mean? <laughs> Tibetan monastics, that's joke. <laughs> Congratulations. At the beginning, one mistake. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> You'll end up translating Jimpa. Oh. Oh. You'll end up translating him. Instead of translating him. <laughs> <laughs> As uh, Chairman has uh, mentioned, uh, this is the 27th meeting. Uh, at the beginning, I think almost now 30 years ago, uh, when we start that, I think mainly uh, my own out of curiosity, uh, and as some of uh, the scientists, also I think mainly out of curiosity. Uh, so meeting uh, between strangers <laughs> to, to Tibetan, <laughs> these strangers. <laughs> you also, I think, Dalai Lama, <laughs> mis mysterious person <laughs> from, from mysterious land. <laughs> that once we said, a talk, then we know each other. Oh, same human being, yeah. mentally, emotionally, physically. And then I think on top of that, I think scientist side and my side, we all, you see, some sort of sense of concern about humanity, about future of humanity. So you have your own sort of profession field that is science, modern science. Uh, of course, I cannot describe myself something profession, but just a student of Buddhism in general and particularly the Nalanda tradition. So, and then suddenly, as a Buddhist practitioner, every morning we pray entire sentient benefit for happiness for entire sentient being. So, so naturally, if you're serious about this prayer, then uh, the sentient being on uh, different galaxies, far away from, from us, we cannot do anything. Or directly or indirectly, nothing can be done. At least on this planet, you see, we have, there is some connection. And also, you see, we ourselves, the part of the uh, then six billion human being. So, if you really uh, sort of praying or sort of say they develop some kind of sense of concern of all sentient being, then let us uh, think seriously about six billion human being on this planet. So then, uh, in our tradition, a lot of explanation about emotion. And also, we ourselves practice the method uh, when we develop certain negative emotion, how to tackle these things. So then, the uh, the very purpose of sort of scientific research also, you see, uh, uh, in, in one way, of course, try to find reality. 
for what purpose? Not necessarily because of just because of the for the sake of knowledge. Uh, seek knowledge, but also you see, uh, the, these people also you see uh, through their research how we can get some benefit to be human being. So different way of approach, but mainly it's all let's see some sort of sense of concern of well-being of this planet. So then, uh, uh, with this spirit, you see, we carry this sort of dialogue. And then eventually, the dialogue becoming more serious and also eventually institutionalized. I think particularly there, to the sixth meeting, by the way, in South India. Mm. I think really, uh, I think creates Kasota. I think very strong positive impact in in thousands of young monk students there. And some scientists also have got some kind of imp impression, isn't it? It's Even true. Our dis our discussion yeah. is do that way, <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> uh, so now. I want you to tell the, I think those new, because of the, uh, the person, the attendees. Uh, attendees, oh. The, uh, this kind of meeting is to two purposes. One purpose is uh, extend our knowledge. Uh, I think as far as matter is concerned, particle is concerned, Western or say modern science highly developed. Their knowledge is really incredible. So very useful for us to learn from their knowledge, uh, their finding through experiment. Then to the uh, Western scientist about mind, about emotion. There is a big sort of contrast their knowledge about matter, very high. Advanced. Their knowledge about mind, not that much. <laughs> <laughs> if may I say so. <laughs> uh, so you see, uh, uh, our sort of varsity, uh, our dialogue, this mission benefit. In the, in the field of knowledge. So this is one purpose. Uh, then another sort of purpose is uh, from our knowledge, now, now today, on our planet, uh, I think f for physical comfort, the uh, science, immense sort of city, contribution. And then, to technology, uh, our life, generally speaking, become much easier, much comfortable, wonderful. And also in the medical field, to research, there's a lot of sort of the new that, discoveries. No? New discoveries. And so it becomes easier to tackle certain disease, illness like that. Wonderful. Uh, now, they, there are a lot of problems about uh, due to too much sort of emotions. Uh, we call destructive emotions. So that even uh, medical science or health health point oh. point of view, and the healthy society, peaceful family, happy family, happy individual, ultimately related with emotion. A mind. Uh, so, uh, in order to deal these problems, mainly created by uh, negative emotion, uh, firstly, we should have knowledge, fuller knowledge, about the function of these different emotions and its own so that kind of laws. Uh, oh, uh, its own laws. Oh, like that. Uh, so, through our joint sort of effort 
uh, how to uh, how to make a contribution. Firstly, happier individual. Through that way, happier family and happier community or society. Through that way, our final aim is happier now seven billion human beings. Certainly, this problem, much problem, our own creation. And, uh, and here, weapons also, I think, uh, one sort of major factor to create more killing, more violence. Uh, so, like America, there's a lot of talk about gun control. Uh, that means, you see, people consider uh, gun available some sort of violence. You see, more kasuta. Easily. Uh, easily. Oh. So then, uh, from deeper way, uh, if you think real gun, real gun control related here. Here, uh, less anger, less hatred. Uh, then, the gun uh, become like ornament, right? Not really. Uh, no danger. Uh, but so long, here, the negative, violent emotion there, even without gun, uh, you can, you can do, or stone, I think always, <laughs> I think you cannot, you cannot control a stone, <laughs> always available, <laughs> or some brick, always brick. Sort of available. <laughs> Even you see this, Kazati. Nails. Nails. <laughs> 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 that, that is, you see, when I was young, uh, when I fighting with my elder brother, my main weapon is nail. <laughs> 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 so some injuries on his face, <laughs> really. <laughs> so therefore, real, ultimately, gun control. Yeah. Uh, so that does not mean uh, some some serious operation here Such and uh, some sort of part of brain removed. Not that way. <laughs> but you see, through training of mind. And eventually, you see these uh, sort of kasota, Destructive. No, violent sort of emotion reduce uh, to, uh, to increase the positive emotion. That's, that's possible. Uh, not necessarily be a religious person, even without belief. It's simply the day to day life happier when emotion develops. Uh, Wants to see no some the, uh, some way to deal this uh, negative emotion. If if person knows, then when about this destructive emotion come, and all the method within his own his or her own hand. So, so that's one of our purpose. One of the purpose. One purpose extend our knowledge about external world, internal world. Another thing uh, from our knowledge, how to make contribution for a better world, happier humanity. So, now last. Now, almost 30 years, I think interest, both sides, you see, increasing. So now we are not only sort of just talking, but some of you really now carrying because of the efforts on the propagating, you see, the propagating more. Because the implementation. Right? Uh, imp implementation. implementation. Oh. So, grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Your mm. Highness. Thank you. So, now this craving, Gaza. Craving, desire, and addiction. Huh? 
I don't know the exact meaning. <laughs> we all have but no desire, uh, I think without desire, then mo no movement. No movement, no progress. Uh, even we call the bodhicitta. The altruistic awakening mind, which is cherished, is actually understood to be in the form of an aspiration, a kind of a desire. Uh, without that, there's no enthusiasm. No enthusiasm, uh, no action. No action, no progress. I think without desire, then perhaps I think then fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Addictions in the Kazakhstan. Addictions in the Changira, the Bagir, the Dirva, the Dirva, the Dirva, the Nyangum, the Nyalan Show, the Nyalan Show, the Kadun, the Sambul edition of Tumare. So His Holiness is wondering whether we can apply the term addiction towards more constructive activity, huh. or is it always negative? <laughs> well, we talk about workaholism, working too much, huh. and we use the term that makes it sound like it's an addiction. So we could ask ourselves, is there such a thing as working too hard for your own good and that of society? Normally we think of work as a good thing. No. The chick, the Casota, Nizzi Chetabuzi Gan, the chick, the Tab, Madoko, Tata, do you know? Let it, my shitty chill. His holiness is wondering, you know, the term, you know, um, is it the way in which it is being applied? Um, is it more specific or is it kind of more broadly defined? So we the, cr the craving has all the more, more kind of so too much attachment. Too right. much right. attachment, right. Then attachment, usually, uh, uh, if we, we consider biased. So there are a lot of mental projection involved. So you too much sort of, uh, because of the craving. Craving, love. Uh, uh, too much attachment. Uh, opposite anger. So both, I think, anger and this craving or attachment, both uh, uh, not looking the object uh, objectively. In a realistic manner. No. Or much sort of mental projection involved. I don't know. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> now, next few days, you see, uh, we enrich our knowledge now in this, this field. Yes. yes. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you don't know much about craving. <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll inform you <laughs> from our side. Uh, this is our 27th, as you've said, oh. you said, and it's been almost 26, going on 27 years that Mind and Life has had these dialogues. And we're especially delighted to be here once again with you to bring together a wonderful group of scientists to take up this theme of craving, desire, and addiction. And one of the characteristic features, as you know, of these dialogues is that we not only bring together might say experts in the field from the scientific standpoint, but we also bring together people like Mathieu and others around the circle, Sarah, who have experience with the contemplative dimensions, but also from the Christian as well as the Buddhist perspectives uh, with regards to the same questions of desire, which as you say can be aspiration, or it can veer into grasping and clinging and attachment, in which case it has its own negative connotations. And these are 
universal problems. They're not strictly from the East or the West or Asian traditions or Western traditions, but they are universal problems. And so we found that bringing together this extraordinary diversity of individuals from different disciplines, even from different cultures, to look not only at the scientific and external dimensions of the problem, but also from the inner experiential, first person experiential dimensions of the problem, that this is a, a kind of format and methodology which has been highly valued and fruitful for us. We learn from you, and to a certain extent you learn from us. This is a format which, of course, goes back to the very beginning when Francisco Varela and Adam Engel and yourself began this dialogue. And so we've maintained a kind of fidelity all the way to this meeting, kind of faithfulness to that way of working together. You know, you mentioned this uh, aspect of the aspirational aspect of desire. And it's also very much the case that in the West, we too feel like in our scientific and philosophical traditions, aspiration is very much at the heart of what brings us alive, what brings us into engagement with uh, the highest of our ideals. You know, in Aristotle's uh, articulation of the great virtues and values in life, he speaks of truth, beauty, and goodness. And that these are a kind of virtues towards which we should aspire, we should desire truth. We should desire to make the world more beautiful, look around us and we should try to become and to practice the good. And yet here also, even in the most, you might say, highest goals of our lives, we can also feel that if the desires become too great and they become too attached to myself, then my aspiration for truth might well veer into forms of research which are unethical during the time of the Second World War, there were experiments that were done which were hideous for the sake of understanding. Human beings were put into extraordinary suffering. Why? That aspiration becomes then perverted, becomes its opposite. Or beauty. We love beauty. We seek the beauty in nature. We seek to, through our arts to make the world more beautiful. This is wonderful. And yet, there are also ways in which we can become so fascinated and fixated on beauty that we become preoccupied, obsessed with this for ourselves, or pornography, sensual desires, and so forth, that also lead us into difficulties. That being said, finally, also with goodness. Goodness itself, you'd think, well, what could be the possibilities there? But you know, who's good? Let's say that I'm a teacher, I'm a monk, and I'm an authority for goodness. Am I going to then stand as judge and jury over the actions of everyone and insist that they obey my command because my good is the universal truth of goodness? In which case that narrow view becomes a kind of tyranny, right? So in every one of these aspirational motifs, we also suffer the possibilities of distortion. So it's not only in substance abuse or in behavioral uh, addictions and so forth. You know, it's not only in cocaine and heroin or things of that sort that one sees these, these dangers associated with an exertion, an overemphasis on desire. <laughs> That curtain. Yeah, there's a glare coming from that window. Yeah. Oh. I cannot see Rigi's face clearly. <laughs> Good now. Good. <laughs> yes. And so um, we stand before this, uh, in this meeting, before the desire, you could say the desire to relieve 
ourselves and our world from some of the suffering that is caused by this attachment, this excessive attachment and craving. And that we have the, the proper measure, you could say, of desire and aspiration for that which is true, beautiful, and good. So we've gathered together, as we always do, an extraordinary group of people to take up this task. People who've worked at this theme at the highest possible level of their competency and in their diverse ways across different fields of inquiry. And I would like to suggest that this is also not just a, a one-off, we would say, a single event, that Mind and Life really has now committed itself to a longer research and, and uh, activity in this area of craving, desire, and addiction. There will be a research project that uh, Wendy Hasenkamp is actually directing uh, with colleagues at universities and clini clinical researchers to take up specifically a survey around desire, its excesses, forms of addiction, and in particular its relationship to the, uh, to the self. How is it we understand our own, our own nature, our own self? Next summer there'll be approximately 150 young scholars and scientists who'll come together at our annual research summer institute. And at that institute they will likewise be focused on the same theme. Then there are small research grants that we give named after Francisco Varela. They likewise will in all likelihood be focused increasingly on this general area of research in the hopes that we can make an enduring impact on the suffering that's associated with craving, desire, and addiction. You know, this area of craving, desire, and addiction is one example of a still larger range of work that Mind and Life has undertaken, largely under your inspiration. And one of the most important areas, the second area, concerns what you have called secular ethics. And so Mind and Life's work in this area of ethics and education, the Mind and Life initiative in ethics and education has become a very prominent and important part of our work now and into the distant future. And as you know, we've again, in a similar way, brought together an extraordinary range of individuals to try to cultivate what is innately our nature of goodness, compassion, kindness, and altruistic behavior. These capacities which are there within us, we feel, as you do as well, can from early childhood all the way through to adulthood be cultivated in ways that support then a future ethical life and the betterment of humanity into the future. So we're here not only to learn and to work concerning craving, desire, and addiction, but also to situate that within this larger and more ambitious project of a true ethics for humanity. Now, for 26 years, we've steadfastly walked together this path of inquiry. At first, it was simply, as you say, the uh, curiosity which we had, the joy of discovery, the joy of mutual understanding, and so on. And then it became increasingly evident that this was a potentially of value to others. And so we published over 15 books together, which has been a joy as well. And then, just in last, last January, we had the wonderful meeting in Mungot in South India, which was such a wonderful celebration of this mind and life work, but also the work of others uh, like the Science for Monks program and the Emory Tibet Science Initiative. So these different dimensions of our collaboration were in some ways culminated in that event. But what I'd like to speak about now uh, is something that you have also brought up very often at the end of one of our Mind and Life sessions. Because not only have we worked energetically and intellectually and scientifically over these many years together, but time and again at the end of these meetings you often speak of the human connections. The human connections which are also fostered by this common work that we do. And just so you speak of friendship. Today I wonder if we might not speak about this just at the beginning of our work together. You know, spiritual friendship is a rare and precious, things, precious thing in this modern time, this modern life of ours. Modern life seems to challenge all the old 
bases for human relationships, often leading to a kind of fragmentation of the family, of human society. And uh, we don't often... Uh, uh, yeah, and modernity provides little guidance, it seems to me, as to the new forms that will develop under which social life can flourish. And I would suggest that this theme, this theme of spiritual friendship, friendship born of a common work, may become the rich and fertile ground out of which the new relationships that we endure, the, the enduring relationships, will actually, actually grow. Friendships which can reach across boundaries, cultures, races, religions, we don't need to look like each other. We don't need to have the same faith. Mm -hmm. But we have a common concern for the well-being of humanity. And that brings us together in a common work through friendship. You know, the Buddha's name, I'm always struck, means uh, the one who is awake, I believe. The one who is awake. Sanji is it. Sanji is it. And then it seems to me that in coming together, engaging together in a rigorous theme of deep significance, that we wake up on each other. Mm. I become more awake because of your argument, mm. your thinking, your heart force. You become more awake through my engagement so that we wake up on each other. I'm reminded of William Blake's statement that opposition is true friendship. Opposition is true friendship. And if the awakened consciousness of the Buddha seems so far from our individual working, perhaps by working together, by becoming more awake on each other, that consciousness of the one who is awake, the consciousness of the Buddha, will become closer to us as a community than it is to me as an individual. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm told that Ananda, I'm not a great scholar of the Buddhist tradition, I'm afraid, but Ananda is reported to have said to the Buddha that good friendship was half of the spiritual life. And that the Buddha replied, not so, Ananda, not so. This is the entirety of the holy life that the friendship we foster to each other could be, you could say, the entirety of the spiritual life. Mm. So that within your tradition, of Buddhism, this uh, practice, you could say, of friendship is the practice of the spiritual life, the whole of the spiritual life. So also in the New Testament tradition, one finds a similar teaching where Jesus says to his disciples, inasmuch as you love one another as I have loved you, you are my friend. The friend, you could say, of Jesus. I bring this up because it seems to me that we have the opportunity here to, to practice that awakening on each other, that becoming friends with each other through the common work that we do, the learning that we have from each other. And we do this here in your through your hospitality, through your generous, open hospitality of a world which is occupied by scientists, neuroscientists, physicists, psychologists, religious scholars, contemplative practitioners, all of us coming together from our different cultures, from our different worlds, to take up this common work in service of those who are suffering, seeking to promote human flourishing through that ethics and education, as well as through craving, desire, and addiction, understanding that. So thank you for your hospitality. Thank you also for inviting us into your home. Now, the next person who will be presenting uh, will be Diana Chapman Walsh. 
She and I are going to change seats. She'll be sitting here presenting to you. Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank you. Your Holiness. Thanks. I add my words of thanks to you for this great privilege of learning with you about these complicated questions we have begun to explore. This is our 47th dialogue. It is my second only. I was with you, as you recall, in South yes. India for oh. the remarkable gathering in Mundgad. So inspiring, so interesting. I learned a great deal, but I still have a great deal to learn. I am new. But I want to speak to you this morning about this topic that we will be discussing. We have this printed program, and in the program for each of the presenters and the moderators, we have biographical sketches. But I somehow forgot to mention in mine that I worked in this field for many years. Oh. And then I moved out of the field. So I will be in the role of moderator. We have three moderators for the week. I'm one, your friend Richie, whom you can now see because the light <coughs> is fixed, and your friend Roshi Joan Halifax. We will take turns in this role as moderator. But we decided, the whole faculty, when we came together to plan this meeting, that the topic was broad and complicated. So we should take a little bit of time at the beginning and put a kind of frame around it so that we know where the work we'll be doing fits. So I will be starting that process for maybe 30 minutes, and then Richie will complete it. So that's our plan for the morning is to put this all in a bit of a context for everyone. I was a professor of public health at Harvard University, where I chaired a department there called Health and Social Behavior. We were sociologists and social epidemiologists. Everybody has to be an ologist and psychologist. And we were working on the social and behavioral aspects of health and illness, trying to understand the human body and the things that go wrong and go right with it in the larger world of relationships and society and culture. That was our work. And some of us in this department that I led focused much of our research on policies related to alcohol, and tobacco and other drugs on the highways, driving cars, in workplaces, doing work in schools and colleges where these problems would arise, always with an interest in the larger, this larger context of the underlying social processes and factors and influences that were driving those behaviors to a large extent. That was, that was our focus. And our purpose in doing that was very much in keeping with the purpose Your Holiness described for these meetings. So our focus was on prevention. We were trying to figure out why these problems occur, where and how they occur, and were there things that we could design and study and test that would prevent them. And we sometimes talked of it as translational research. So just as you have Jimpa at your side to translate back and forth from English to Tibetan, this kind of research is trying to translate from the very specific studies that are done by the natural scientists, and we're going to be hearing a lot of those, to try to figure out how to translate those mm. and bring them out into the world. Just as, mm. just as you said, the field of public health has been very much focused on that challenge. We won't be discussing 
these public health interventions in, in great detail this week. But it bears mentioning that they too are science-based. They're rooted in science and scientific enterprise, but the social sciences rather than mm -hmm. the natural sciences. So in addition to the neuroscience we'll be discussing at some length, the United States National Institute on Drug Abuse, that's the institute at the National Institutes of Health, this very big apparatus in Washington, D.C. that funds a great deal of important research in our country. And that agency is directed by a woman named Nora Volkow, who will be with us for this meeting. She, she was unable to be here today for the opening, but she will join us on Wednesday. It's very exciting that she will be here. She plays a very important role in our country looking at these problems. So that institute funds the kind of neuroscience studies that we'll be talking about, but it also does fund these more social science-oriented uh, studies. So our department at Harvard is just one example, and there are many like them around the country and the world, looked at, worked across what we thought of as a continuum, the public health continuum. So it ran from prevention to intervention to treatment, these three levels. So intervention. Would you describe what you mean by intervention so, in this context? So, prevention. prevention. Yes, so there's okay. the prevention. Now then, so the difference between so, okay. treatment, treatment, treatment and, and intervention. intervention. So, what is intervention? So we think of primary prevention is, can you figure out a way to stop this problem from even beginning? Mm. Can you figure out a way through taxation, mm. laws, policies, mm. to remove well, this temptation mm. so that no one has to even think about it? Is there and that's primary prevention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And you're thinking about the whole population. Oh. Can we protect the population? For secondary prevention, you're thinking about people who have been already exposed. Oh. They're already oh. dealing with it. But can you prevent the harm? <laughs> no. So the intervention would be? So, no. 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 so the intervention would be right. the project, no the program designed to reach in and work with the people who mm. are at risk. And we will hear at the end of the week about a very special mm. intervention mm. program. Mm. And so one of the questions, a kind of philosophical question is, do we have the balance right? Are we putting our energy, our resources, and our effort our, in the right places as we think about these problems? Could we, is there a way that we could head off these kinds of problems that we're talking about in the first place or step in to before they become so serious that they require very intensive treatment farther down mm. along this continuum? And the image, the metaphor, that we would often have in our minds is of a rapidly flowing river and that the medical establishment is downstream and they have this very large enterprise that's pulling people out of the stream and giving them resuscitation and rescuing them and everyone is so busily occupied with that work that no one has the time to walk up the stream and try to understand why people are falling in. So it's this idea, are we focused in the right place? as we think about, as a society, how to manage some of these problems. So, so that's just a little sense of how public health approaches this. this. Our group, the group that I was leading, also did work on treatment questions. We published in 1991 a study that was something called a randomized trial of different ways to offer treatment for people at the workplace who were drinking and getting in trouble at work. There were different ideas about how to help them, and we designed a very rigorous study to test out those different strategies and see which one was more effective, and published it in a journal called the New England Journal of Medicine. So that study took 10 years to complete. It was an elaborate thing, and it was carefully designed to address a specific question about 
how much treatment is enough. But it was also designed to try to move the methodology forward, to try to do this study in a better, more careful way, because the research in the field needed to move forward. And that's one of the things that often comes out of these dialogues, too, that the, the research methodology is moved forward. So we can help hope that that will be one of the consequences. So shortly after I did that 10-year study and all that effort, I was plucked out of Harvard and invited to be a college president. So I left all of that thinking about craving, desire, and addiction behind, turned my attention to the question of, could I make myself into a leader who could be trusted? That was hard work. <laughs> and I did that work for 14 years, and I tried to lead from within, from my heart, in a way that other people could trust, that I was leading from values that they could honor and support. So that was a project. So now I'm back. I've turned my attention back to this topic, unexpectedly, because of this meeting. And I've returned to a field that I once knew very well. I'm very conscious that much has changed, a great deal has changed in this field in these 20 years. And most importantly, the science and the neuroscience, it has exploded. It is so much more profound and knowledgeable than it was when I was doing mm. this work. And in addition, there's much that has not so, so much changed in the way societies think about these issues and deal with them. So it's, it's both. The dramatic scientific progress in the field will be reviewed for us in the early part of this week by our three presenters who come from branches of neuroscience and by our co-moderator, whom you know so well, Richie Davidson. And that science is very exciting. And we're going to learn a lot more of it this week. Your Holiness has already learned a lot of neuroscience, but I think you'll find we'll learn even more. Richie will give us an orientation shortly to some of what's to come, and I'm looking forward to that, as I expect you are too. These scientists, Richie has instructed them to invite us in under the hood. You know a car when you lift the hood and look in at the engine? So these scientists will invite us in to see underneath their findings what goes on. And it's a place I know Your Holiness likes to be. Looking taking problems apart as you did the clocks in the Portola Palace, right? Looking at how they work, understanding the logic behind them the mechanics that validate the findings of the studies. And so we'll have time for that this week, and it will be fun for mm. us all. Mm. As we orient ourselves to the week, Your Holiness may be reminded of ways in which this dialogue builds on earlier ones. As a newcomer, I have only the published record from which to try to extract that sense of continuity. But that record points to some bright threads, I believe, that have run through many of the dialogues that have occurred around this table. For this week's topic, for example, builds very directly on the March 2000 meeting here, right here, on the theme of destructive emotions. That was organized and moderated by Dan Goleman, who also mm -hmm. wrote the book 13 years ago. It was Mind and Life 7. We've progressed far. And that meeting fed the research program that Richie and others have been advancing ever since. The research programs that are very much the reason that there has been this explosion in scientific knowledge. So we can only hope that our efforts this week will be nearly as fruitful and consequential as that meeting was 13 years ago. Your Holiness wrote the preface for Dan Goldman's book, from that meeting, and you said this, this is a quotation from your preface, 
Much human suffering stems from destructive emotions, as hatred breeds violence, as you spoke earlier, or craving fuels addiction. One of our most basic responsibilities as caring people is to alleviate the human costs of such out-of-control emotions. In that mission, I feel that Buddhism and science both have much to contribute. Amen, indeed. And so we've returned this week, 13 years later, to take up that responsibility. We want to ask ourselves what we know, more specifically about how craving fuels addiction, and about how we, as caring people, can help alleviate the human cost. So that is our task today, as set forth by you mm -hmm. 13 years ago. So now I want to just say a few words you asked at the beginning about this word addiction and how we're thinking about it, and try to lay a little context for that. So at the beginning, our focus primarily will be the abuse of and addiction to dangerous substances, alcohol, nicotine, cigarette smoking, and illegal drugs that are widely used around the world. They're used in some places more than others, as we will see. And our concern will extend as well to drugs that are legal, not illegal, prescription medications, painkillers, sedatives, stimulants, that are being used more and more for non-medical purposes. So to feel good, to feel better, to do better cognitively, hmm. athletically, the, the dope, doping scandals in the bicycle races and other races, or simply out of curiosity at first, a different kind of curiosity than the one you spoke of at the outset, a curiosity that can lead to trouble. In the West, the abuse of... Uh, Sometimes young people just want to try these things out, yeah, that's right, that's right. see how it feels. Then they get into trouble. Mm. <laughs> His Holiness, as you were speaking about the problem of addiction, particularly of substance abuses, um, the thought occurred to him, wanted to ask you a question. And the question is the following. If you look at, say, for example, alcohol abuse, mm -hmm. Uh, or drug abuse. Um, among the people who end up becoming addicted, uh, is it or has it been done where you can look for the reason why they got into the habit in the first place? Is it out of wanting some kind of relief because they feel very miserable? Mm -hmm. Or whether they were looking for some kind of, you know, sense of fun? Actually, um, mentally, mm -hmm. is there a lot of sort of worry or worry. something? So, at least you should try to some kind of relief. Relief, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yes. Short term relief. Yes. And then you see use this and then eventually become addicted. addicted. Uh -huh. Yes. So then the second category would be people who do As it for you mentioned. Fun, uh -huh. Like kind of almost like kind of a leisure activity right. or entertainment right. activity. Right. As a f source of fun. Mm -hmm. And then as a result they become habituated mm -hmm. and addicted. And there could be a third one where someone just simply wants to try it out. Is there any way of teasing these out in terms of percentage uh, among the addicts? So I do not have those statistics. I do not think we have them as yet, but certainly it's a combination, I think. And uh, we will hear this afternoon from Mark mm. Lewis, who has studied these issues. Um, I think very often the people who go in deeply into trouble... That's right. Have some, in most cases, I think that. There's some underlying no. suffering. It's to relieve some deep, deep pain. Not always, but so the, the point of entry, the doorway mm. in, can be any one of these different ways. But I believe the people who get deeply in trouble, for the most part, are trying to heal a wound inside mm. with the substance. That would be my 
sense, and will mm-hmm. many people. There is also, of course, the very interesting brain mechanisms that we will hear. Fascinating. Yeah. And we have some remarkable scientists who will show you their studies that show what happens in the brain that leads to addiction. So in other words, Diana, you are saying there is no actual study that has done, that but not, not percentages. it could be the different points of entry, but you are suggesting those who become really addicted badly and continue right. to use it, may be doing it to get some kind of relief. Right, that's my sense. Yes. But those are very good questions, and questions we will be hmm. examining. So we will be interested, too, in extensions of the concept of addiction to a wider range of destructive behaviors that have compulsive qualities, qualities in which we feel we... So another problem that raises is that among the addicts, you know, I mean, is it possible to sort of guess what kind of proportion between people who don't see it's a problem and mm. people who see actually it recognize it is a problem? Mm-hmm. Well, yes, and we will hear discussions of that as the week mm-hmm. goes okay. on too. And, and, and there is certainly a strong feeling among social scientists that the recognition that one has a problem is an important step towards the resolution. Of that right. So then these, this larger frame, now we're, we started with the drugs, now we're moving it out a bit. Behaviors that have these compulsive qualities, gambling, wanting mm-hmm. to bet money, overeating, sex, work, this idea of workaholism, or the latest one, perhaps you have not heard of it, internet addiction. <laughs> I spoke at a conference at Harvard a few years ago on a panel with college presidents and whatnot, but we had one student participant, and he said he had several portals, like windows, portals, into the world, and RL, the letters RL, was not his best. We elders looked at him and said, excuse me, RL, he said, yes, real life. <laughs> real life was not his best portal. That made us worry. Mm. <laughs> So he became fascinated in this world of fantasy and didn't like to come out of it and confront real life. It wasn't so pleasant. There are young people who call themselves gamers, who play video games day and night, and they call their passion gaming. They have their own language, and they become lost in these virtual worlds that absorb them, body and soul. And that's because for them, as one book argued, reality is broken. Reality mm-hmm. is broken. So we can ask ourselves, what is this, what is this about? So Zolan is wondering, you know, so you know, as a result, I mean, are they, you know, having a sense of fulfillment, satisfaction, happy? Well, we elders, when we see them, don't think so. <laughs> but they don't. <laughs> they don't always agree. That's a good question. <laughs> is it bad or not? We don't know. And it's not only the young. It is increasingly us. People of all ages all around the world, some of them captured in very funny photo essays and video essays up on the net, reveal us engaging, sort of, halfway pretending that we're really paying attention in normal social interactions when we're totally focused on our little iPhones, sending messages, reading messages, sitting at lunch, sitting at dinner, having a date, all of these things, but somehow this is more real than the moment. So, and most dangerously, of course, when we are driving, mm-hmm. people are texting. 
So we, we talk about multitasking, doing many tasks all at the same time. We're obsessed by a kind of frantic busy... See, Solon is wondering, you know, those who spend many hours in, almost in a sort of a compulsive manner in these kind of um, um, digital world, mm -hmm. um, would you kind of um, sort of, you know, uh, envision them having... So such, such person, now? you see, let them more sort of research, thinking. Then, and do you find and do you see some differences because they are sort of all sort of energy, just you see. In the digital world, I mean, his so attention. So that damage, their own ability to analyze. They, they, in, in certain tasks, they can actually get better in huh? their attention because they are focused. They're oh, focused single pointed. Single huh? pointed. Right, right. Yes, so there's actually good evidence to suggest that they can actually get better on certain tasks but probably worse on others. So it's, um, it's, it's a complicated picture. Sure. <laughs> so we laugh at ourselves about this felt sense that we are out of control, that we're in the, in the thrall of these social addictions. We lightly use metaphors of enslavement or tyranny or entrapment that we're stuck in these places. We admit that our loss of control is sometimes destructive to ourselves and to our relationships and others, even as we persist in them and watch them escalate. They can lead, some people believe, into distorted mind patterns, the structuring of our minds in ways we don't even notice, when the behaviors have become socially accepted, taken for granted, normalized. So for example, patterns of racism and sexism in our societies are two troubling examples. They're all around us. We're not looking critically at them. We just take them for granted. They diminish our free will, in a sense. They create blinders in the way that we are seeing reality. And these are some of the processes that we hope we'll unpack a bit this week. And then beyond this, moving up now to a higher plane, we may want to elevate this theme of craving and addiction to the question of Western materialist culture. You mentioned that. The culture we Westerns are exporting all over the globe now. We are addicted to oil, President George Bush famously declared in the US as he led our country into a war against terror that was as much a war for oil. We moderns are addicted, we might agree, to power, to speed, to technology, to conspicuous consumption, and an escalating taste for ultra-luxury. This wonderful used to be good enough, and now it's got to be even more wonderful. And a growing arsenal, as you said earlier, of insanely dangerous weapons. And so we might ask what role these modern compulsions are playing in the destruction of the life support system on which human flourishing, human survival, absolutely depends. What does that question portend? What does it, where does it lead us? This is where your vision, your holiness, of an ethics, an educational, ethical uh, approach is so urgently needed, your secular ethics, and this was the theme of the 2011 dialogue, Mind and Life 23, Ecology, Ethics, and Interdependence. Perhaps a deeper understanding this week of the nature of addictions and compulsions as we move through our discussions will shed some new light on this question, this technological trap in which we pre precocious humans with our blind cravings have ensnared ourselves. The technology, as you said, has brought great benefits to society, but also serious threats and worries. The real and present dangers of, on one side, nuclear winter, that chilling image of nuclear winter. On the other side, a melting planet. Very frightening. 
But first, we want to stay close to the science of addiction. And we'll begin by asking ourselves what we know about the extent of the problem. How serious a problem is it? We can reckon the cost of addictions first in terms of something that epidemiologists call the five, disease, five Ds, so death, disease, dysfunction, dis dis disability, dysfunction, and dissatisfaction. Death, disease, disability, dysfunction, dissatisfaction. Again, a continuum. The five d Ds. The Quran says that the remne is the most important thing in the world. The remne, epidemics. Remne, remne is the most important thing in the world. The DNA is the most important thing in the world. So these har harmful consequences affect people of all ages, from, from infants, exposed in utero sometimes, or in very early life, to drugs that stunt their development for their entire lives, to adolescents who are painfully vulnerable, during a very awkward life stage, to young adults whose experimental use of drugs, that curiosity we talked about, can convert over time to a true addiction, and if they become parents into unsafe, chaotic, chaotic homes that can reverberate through intergenerational cycles of dysfunction and suffering and pain. The ravages of addiction are widespread in the West and in many parts of the world and are implicated in an immense and increasing amount of human suffering. And I had some statistics, but I think I will race through them and just say we can come back later because we don't want to go on too long, that the problems are very, very serious all over the world. And so then just a quick word about the arc of the program this week. Our effort for much of the early part of the week, as I said, will be to understand the nature of craving and addiction and what might be done to interrupt what's been called an expanding cycle of dysfunction in the brain. In the brain. From the standpoint of Western science, our presenters, Mark Lewis, um, Kent Berridge, whom you said is a new person mm -hmm. when you saw him. <laughs> You'll find he's a quite wonderful new person. <laughs> and Nora Volkov, who will join us in a day or two. They will be posing the scientific questions, and Richie will be, of course, moderating and helping us understand those, and he will preview those in a moment. One of our neuroscientists this afternoon's presenter, Mark Lewis, blends his professional expertise with his personal experience as a former addict. And in doing so, he opens the first-person perspective that Francisco Varela foresaw as really essential to a full accounting of the nature of the human mind. So we'll listen this afternoon for the impact of that dual perspective. And meanwhile, our contemplative scholars, Thumpton Jimpa, who will step out of his role as translator and become a presenter, and Mathieu Ricard, your very good friend, and Wendy Farley from the Christian uh, tradition, will present sophisticated understandings from early Buddhist and Christian thinking, early mind study, we might call it, of the fundamental nature of craving and desire and the path to liberation. So that will be an interesting connection to the science. And here we will be listening for similarities, commonalities between the early spiritual teachers and with modern science, and we'll also be interested in differences from which we may learn a great deal. And as we do that, Roshi Joan Halifax, who is our third moderator, will help us with her vast experience of these meetings and of so much else, will help us understand that. Toward the end of the week, we'll hear from two behavioral scientists, one a Danish anthropologist, Vibeka Frank, the other, they're sitting together, an American psychologist, Sarah Bowen. And these two women scholars will reground us in other realities beyond the individual into social and cultural considerations and beyond the research bench into the clinic and the consulting room. So that move you described at the beginning into practical applications. 
we will likely encounter a number of questions, philosophical and practical, that may challenge some of the assumptions that the scientists have been able to bracket and hold at bay as they've pursued their causal chains deep into the human brain. And we will come to those as the week progresses. So I would just like to end with one more of the previous dialogues, Mind and Life 12, on the topic of neuroplasticity, the dialogue that Sharon Bigley described in her book, Train Your Mind, Change Your Brain. She wrote this, the conscious act of thinking about one's thoughts in a different way changes the very brain circuits that do the thinking. Studies using neuroimaging show how very real those changes are, and they come from within. And so, she predicted, this knowledge will in time, as it disseminates, become, this is a quotation, become a central part of our lives and our understanding of what it means to be human. Such an important insight. For if, as she says, modern science seems to be offering us a radically different view of human possibility, the possibility that we can train our minds, which you have known, you Buddhists, for a very long time, then with that may emerge an equally radical reconsideration of our responsibility as humans. And this returns us against, again to Your Holiness's vision of a secular ethics and education in ethics. So here we are, with all of this prior work as a sturdy foundation for us this week, with a deeply thoughtful group of scholars to push the old questions farther and to raise new ones and discover them. And we are in, I think, for a very great treat. So we thank you again from deep within our hearts for the gift of your time and of your attention, your exquisite attention. It's such a model for the rest of us and the precious value of the chance to think and learn with you, your holiness. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Your Holiness. Uh, it is a great honor and privilege for me to be sitting in this seat again. Uh, I have learned so much from being in this seat. Uh, and uh, it has been such an inspiration uh, and uh, a source of uh, uh, insight for the research that we and many other scientists have done. And uh, your... Uh, your attention and your kindness have been so greatly appreciated. So it really uh, feels wonderful to be back here. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, today by giving some orientation to some of the issues that we're going to be addressing over the course of the week and raise a number of, of questions. And so uh, I'll just start with um, some uh, initial um, some initial uh, uh, conjectures or premises, and one is something that Diana mentioned, and that is addiction is not something restricted to substances. We are addicted to many uh, kinds of things, not just drugs. Um, and yet, uh, uh, the roots of suffering, according to the Buddhist and other contemplative traditions, uh, qualities like craving and desire and aversion also play important roles, not just in drug addiction, but also in other kinds of addiction as well. Neuroscience teaches us that the circuits in the brain that are important for craving and desire and aversion hijack or they modulate other systems in the brain that are important for regulation, for restraint. Uh, and this is one source of problems that result from the addictive process. And they bias our perception, they bias our 
decision making. And uh, a number of scientists have come to see that this may be uh, one way to understand from a neuroscientific perspective the roots of delusion or ignorance where the very nature of our perception and our decision making is biased by these uh, emotional systems in the brain which are interfering with the systems that are involved in regulation. And I'll show some examples of that as we go along. And then there are individual differences. We're, uh, we're all the same in a very basic way, human beings, but we're also different. We have different temperaments. Uh, we have different personalities. And those play a role in determining which individuals are more likely to become addicted to either drugs or addicted to other kinds of uh, activities like um, uh, uh, to f food addictions or uh, addictions to uh, things like the internet or work. Uh, and one of the fascinating findings in science, which we think is really relevant to secular ethics, particularly in children, is that qualities in very young children, in children four and five years of age, predict the extent to which they'll show addiction when they're adolescents and young adults. And we can measure these qualities longitudinally. So we can measure them in children very, very young and then follow them for 20 years, mm. and we can see how the qualities early in life are associated with the likelihood of becoming addicted later in life. But environment, do you care? There must be also environment difference. Clearly, environment plays a critically important role, but all other things being equal, children who have uh, a uh, difficulty in delaying gratification, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, but being able to um, postpone getting an immediate reward uh, and inhibiting and restraining themselves in, in a way uh, and waiting, children who, who lack that capacity when they're four and five years or old, on average, are more likely to show addiction later in life. Uh, and yes, the environment plays an important role, but these are still features which uh, persist over that period of time. So this is an outline of what I'm going to hopefully cover. I may have to shorten some things as we go along, but I'll talk about the brain circuits that have been Im implicated in addiction and preview some of the work that will be coming. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about the kinds of impairments that are associated with changes in these brain circuits. And then we'll say a little bit about the particular problem of adolescence, which um, in the Western world especially... So the age range would be 11 to... About 14, 16. 16. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll also talk about early interventions as prevention. Mm -hmm. And this is where the intersection of our topic, craving, desire, and addiction, and secular ethics really comes together. Um, because there is increasing evidence to suggest that early interventions uh, that specifically target the kinds of things you've talked about, Your Holiness, in secular ethics. For example, uh, the ethics of restraint, as well as the ethics of virtue and the ethics of compassion, may be important as early interventions that could be preventative mm. uh, when they're taught to young children. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how contemplative interventions for substance uh, abuse may operate in the brain. And then I'd like to raise some issues that are unique to the Tibetan situation. They're, they're actually now, for the first time, good data on addiction among Tibetans in the um, Tibetan Autonomous Region, in, in, uh, uh, and, and I'll share some of those data, uh, which I think are very interesting and um, 
relevant to, to our whole topic. And then we'll end with a whole series of, of questions. So uh, this is a diagram that we'll see many times this week. Um, this is a diagram of uh, the, uh, the medial surface of the brain. So if, if the brain was sliced through the nose and opened up, uh, we're looking at what we call a sagittal view of the brain. This is the front of the brain on the left, the back of the brain on the right. And uh, there are several circuits that are highlighted in this diagram. One is a circuit uh, for motivation and drive uh, in green. Uh, another is a circuit that is labeled reward and salience. And these are two circuits that we'll hear a lot about as playing a very important role in addiction. Um, and particularly, the reward and salience circuit is a circuit that gets very activated uh, in response to stimuli in the environment, information in the environment that has been associated with substances that are abused. Richie, can you explain salient? Salient means um, uh, uh, significant, uh, very um, important. important. Uh, the inhibitory control circuit is also very, very important because that's a circuit that we think is really important uh, for restraint. Uh, and it exerts, it exerts control over these other circuits. And um, what happens in, um, uh, in addiction uh, is, and I'll, I'll go to this, Actually, this, this next slide, so we can see it more clearly. Um, what happens in addiction is that the salience circuit, which is illustrated in red, expands in its importance, and the control or restraint circuit diminishes. And so... Uh, <laughs> So in a non-addicted person, oh. the, the ability to inhibit these impulses mm. is greater, whereas in the addicted brain, uh, the extent to which uh, importance is assigned mm. to uh, to cues in the environment that are associated with these substances expands and the capacity to control them diminishes. And this is a prescription for problems because this will lead to increased drive which will uh, result in an addicted individual consuming more substances. So this is in terms of brain activity? It's in terms of brain, brain circuits, activation. yes. So, in one of your earlier slides, you talked about it could potentially have implications for understanding where delusion and ignorance is arising. So, how would you relate that to this slide? So, the, the way that would work is that the, uh, the salient no. circuit is increased and memory uh, is also... Uh, expanded, and what happens is that memories become distorted oh, yes. um, mm. because they, there's increased significance, inappropriate significance that's attached to them, uh, and so they become distorted uh, in, in memory. So that's one way in which uh, th this kind of delusion can occur. But do you also look at this area? This marvel law. So why would the salient side increase in its activity so much? Uh, the salient side, we're going to be hearing a lot about it, and that will it's actually a good segue to go to this other slide where um, these are the chemicals the, the involved in addiction. One of the ones we're going to be hearing a lot about is dopamine, uh, and that's illustrated in yellow. 
And the, the dopamine has many different functions in the brain. Some of them are listed here, including uh, motivation and pleasure, mm. but also compulsion. Uh, and uh, salience is changed because the dopamine pathways are changed in the brain. And um, Kent Berridge and also Nora Volkow are experts in this area. And they will be presenting um, scientific evidence to show that these dopamine pathways in the brain are altered through the addiction process. And that increases salience. Mm -hmm. Now, I alluded to... Um, oh, I should have said that. 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 So in terms of you know, if we try to understand the delusory part of this, where there is this distortion occurring where the temporary relief seem to take on this you know major importance so how does that distortion play into not this? here you, you know uh, to law causality oh take under the short side of the satisfaction then because i take it as the control here the law control my hand level to super chicken yeah no 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 the other one the other one the pathways are they so what is the orange path? Uh, the, the orange part is another chemical system, <laughs> serotonin. Uh, and uh, that has other functions, uh, including um, some of them are listed here, uh, imp very important in mood, uh, uh, but also many other functions. And uh, uh, that also has been implicated in uh, certain aspects of addiction, although we're going to mostly be hearing about dopamine over the course of the next few days. Yonder <laughs> Uh, if there is one, for example, there you you show the neural this is cause um, neural pathways that yeah, are so, formed so for the dopamine pathways oh, that produce the short sighted sort of desire. Yes. Yeah, so, but the 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 way we think about the causal arrow, just briefly, uh, is when a person who has never tried a substance before mm. tries mm. it, uh, that begins to alter the chemistry of the mm. brain, uh, and then certain. Um, cues in the environment that mm. may have been associated with drug taking uh, are associated with those changes in the brain. And so, for example, let's say a person took a drug in a particular room in their home. When they just go into the room, just the sight of the room or the smell of the room might trigger those same chemical changes in the brain before they actually take the drug. Uh, and that heightens their craving. Uh, and biases their perception, biases their decision making, and then leads them to. That's according to one model of how this works. So, in that sense, the delusion that you're talking about, uh, Richie, is more of a consequence. Yes. Yeah, oh, yes, a it's a consequence. Yes, absolutely a consequence. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. 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 
this is a paper that was published by Nora, who will be coming here. Uh, and it talks about the prefrontal cortex. Uh, and that's an area that's very important in restraint and in con uh, modulation of the impulses. And she, 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 this is the abstract, and I would like to just read the last sentence. She said, disruptions of the prefrontal cortex in addiction underlie not only compulsive drug taking, but also accounts for the disadvantageous behaviors, the problem behaviors that are associated with addiction and the erosion of free will. The erosion of free will. So this points to a very, and th this would be seen, Your Holiness, as a consequence. Not as a cause, but this is a result of. Uh, and then that has further consequences uh, for uh, subsequent problems. It, it will then, it, it's a, a negative spiral. So this is just findings which show uh, that um, from many, many studies, this is a summary of many studies which illustrate that um, individuals who, who have addiction problems have decreased activity in this prefrontal region of the brain, which is, uh, in, as the previous paper described, is associated with a loss of, of free will. Now, one way to think about this is that these changes in the brain can lead to impairments in different ethical dispositions. And one thing that we would say uh, is that prefrontal impairments, the impairments in this circuit that's very important for regulation and <coughs> control of impulses, can lead to impairments in the ethics of restraint, to use a phrase that you've used, Your Holiness. Whereas um, changes in other parts of the brain, in um, areas that uh, Kent will talk about uh, tomorrow, may lead to impairments in the ethics of virtue and the ethics of compassion. Uh, they're they, they're uh, in different circuits of the brain that we know to be more involved in the emotions uh, and may lead to difficulty in the cultivation of these positive emotions that are associated with the ethics of virtue and the ethics of compassion. And this is, uh, I think, some important connections that we'd like to introduce in the first session and we'll go through the theme of the meeting, uh, uh, connecting the work of this meeting with the larger program that Your Holiness has been so interested in and that Mind and Life has now embraced uh, um, relating to the Secular Ethics uh, Initiative. Okay, so I'd like now to talk about adolescence. Um, I have two children, you've met them both, Your Holiness, and uh, fortunately both are now past adolescence. <laughs> <laughs> One of them was uh, an angel, the other one was a little more difficult. But both <laughs> now are, are wonderful. Um, uh, and so this is a study that was published uh, in 2011, and I alluded to this earlier. It's really a, a remarkable study that followed 1,000 individuals in a city in New Zealand, uh, Dunedin, New Zealand, a city very much like Madison. It's a university community. Uh, and they followed a thousand people from birth, just randomly selected. Uh, and they measured, when the children were four and five years of age, they measured their capacity for self-control. And one of the key attributes of that capacity is their children's capacity to delay their gratification. And um, what they showed is that children who at four and five years of age were worse in delaying their gratification, those would be low over here in the number one, all the way at the left. When they were in their early 30s, they had significantly more difficulty and more problems with substance abuse, and, and, had, and, and uh, including not just 
reports of substance abuse, but informant reported, informant rated substance dependence. So this is a very objective measure of um, the use of substances which affect the mind, uh, and they showed more problems uh, when they were in their early 30s, actually at age 32. So this is just based on a measure when the children were four and five years of age. Um, and what they said at the end of this discussion, I'll read the last sentence again for this, they said interventions addressing self-control might reduce mm -hmm. a panoply of societal costs, save taxpayers money, and promote prosperity. Um, they also found that kids who were better at self-control actually were more financially thoughtful and uh, they, were, they engaged in better financial planning. They actually earned more income when they were uh, in their early 30s. And this is after very carefully controlling for the socioeconomic status of their families. So one of the peculiar things in adolescence is that development goes at different rates in different brain systems. So this is a figure which shows the development on the y-axis and on the uh, x-axis is the age. And what you can see is that in adolescence, the emotional regions of the brain, the subcortical regions, develop much more rapidly compared to the prefrontal regions, which are the regulatory regions, important for restraint. And so what we have are children whose subcortical areas are, uh, are quite mature and they're functioning, uh, but there is a relative inability, a difficulty in restraining those impulses because the prefrontal systems are not so well developed. Uh, and in the modern era, puberty actually is occurring. <laughs> And what's happening today in today's society is that adolescence, based on puberty, pubertal changes, mm -hmm. begins earlier. If we look even 100 years ago, Your Holiness, the average age at which puberty starts is about age 16. Today, it's much, much younger. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some subgroups in the United States, you can see the onset of puberty at age 9. Mm -hmm. no. Average. So there are cases of nine years old, but, Correct. but it's much... The, the average is, is about 13. 13, yeah. But still, what we're left with today is a longer period of adolescence than we've ever had before in human history. And uh, that, when, when you... Can you cons unpack? What do you mean? The, because puberty is occurring earlier. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, if we, it, so, so the age at which puberty occurs starts earlier, and um, uh, the, the period during which individuals, therefore, are adolescents, uh, in a biological sense, has been expanded. So, 
So, ke anda di evolution itu jual tak? Lari. Malay. Lari. Nanti anda cik bi tak kata reproduction. Lari. Lojur tu saya dah tahu malu jossum. Lari. Ku saya di evolution kantor tu orang. So, I mean, would that change in the age, kind of lowering of the age of onslaught of puberty? Would that be accounted by evolutionary change? It's a great question. It, it probably is determined by many different factors, including change, differences in diet, oh. differences in um, pollution, uh, differences in urban stress, many different factors, not a single factor. Many, many factors. Mm. But generally, isn't, isn't it the case that the lifespan is increasing? Yes. Oh. Yes. 100 years ago in today. Yes. No. Yes. Yes, but this expansion of the period of adolescence mm -hmm. has resulted in an increase in mortality during the adolescent period and mortality that is virtually all produced by the 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 biasing of decision making and the problems that adolescent the choices that they make Mm. Uh, taking drugs, drunk driving, violence, all mm. of those mm. kinds of things. Um, which and the modern society is not there. So this is from the point of view of modern society. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Australia, indigenous people, uh, or some other places, they completely isolate from the modern, the modern, the modern life. And the it would be different. So His Holiness was asking, has there been any research done on trying to see a difference in a completely traditional kind of pre-modern society? Would we see phenomena like this? It's, it's a wonderful question. I'm not aware of any hmm. scientific evidence on that. So in yeah. that sense, it's not just purely evolutionary force. Right, no, definitely yeah. not purely hmm. evolutionary. Yeah, it's due to yes. changes okay. in the modern okay. environment, okay. yes. So uh, I'd like to move on to, to early interventions uh, as possible prevention. There's a Nobel laureate in economics, James Heckman mm. in Chicago, who analyzed a lot of evidence. And he came to this conclusion. There's a return of seven US mm. dollars for every one dollar of public investment in high quality preschool programs. I believe that we, we, we have a moral responsibility to act at the preschool level to do everything we can, particularly in light of this kind of evidence where there's such a dramatic return on, on, on the investment. And, and we know now from the scientific data... <laughs> Yeah, and of course, this is due to the fact that if we don't intervene, the cost of drug abuse later on, of the uh, accidents that adolescents can get themselves into, of the, the, the wrong choices that they make, uh, the um, remedial educational needs that they may have, all of those add up to this kind of uh, economic payoff for investment in early education. And the, the previous slide that I showed showing that children age four and five who uh, have difficulty delaying their gratification, they're the ones that get into problems mm. later on. So can we teach children at very early on to exercise more restraint, the ethics of mm. restraint in, in your language, your holiness? Can we teach them to delay their gratification? And um, we've, um, uh, along with uh, our colleagues at Mind and Life, many of us have been thinking about how to do this and uh, in one effort, we've developed a kindness curriculum uh, that involves kindness and mindfulness that we teach to preschool children ages four and five years of age. And these are just some of the activities. We teach them to be mindful of their bodies. We teach them uh, that uh, they can go to places uh, where they uh, feel secure to, uh, uh, to practice kindness. Uh, we 
uh, teach them that they should work out problems once they have calmed down. Uh, we also practice gratitude uh, and have uh, uh, a theme on interconnectedness with all other people and the planet, uh, and also uh, uh, caring for the world. Uh, and these are some of the central themes that we introduce. And the curriculum uh, is a curriculum that uh, we um, uh, teach for 90 minutes a week, very three 30-minute periods uh, for eight or 12 weeks. So it's a modest mm. amount of time, not very much. And um, one of the measures that we use is a measure that involves delay of gratification. Uh, and I'd like to just show you um, an example. This is... So this is from a classic experiment that was done many years ago in psychology. This is not our research, but is the work of a very famous psychologist by the name of Walter Michel, very wonderful and important psychologist. Uh, and uh, he did this work uh, where he had young, very young children, and he asked them, I will give you one marshmallow right now, but if you wait for a few minutes, you'll be able to have two marshmallows. Uh, and he just observed what they did. And I'd like to show uh, your holiness and, and everyone else what, how children respond mm -hmm. in this kind of situation. I like this. Okay, so here's the deal. There's a marshmallow. You can either wait, and I'll bring you back another one, so you can have two, or you can eat it now. So you can eat it now, or you can wait, and I'll bring you back two. Okay? Okay, I'll be back. Okay, so I have one marshmallow for each of you. Okay. One. And here's the deal. You can either eat it now, or you can wait till I get back, and you can have two. Okay? Okay. So eat it now or wait till I get back and you can have two. And I'll be back in a little bit. If we wait, we, 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 we,
This. There's just a wide diversity, and you saw some of that diversity there. So we actually gave this measure to a group of... <laughs> so, so this thing, have you taken into account the variability due to being hungry? <laughs> yes, we, that is taken into account. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So we, you can do it with snacks, you can do it with crayons, many different things. And what we found, this is very new data, Your Holiness, that we've just finished analyzing from a group. This is uh, 50 children who received the kindness curriculum, 50 children who are in a control group. And what we see is that the children who are in the kindness curriculum after 12 weeks of receiving the mm. curriculum significantly improved in their ability to delay gratification on this test, mm -hmm. whereas the children who were in the control group showed no significant change. So to us, this suggests that um, a simple mindfulness and kindness curriculum for preschool children can di directly lead to improvements in the ethics of restraint. So it is possible to to educate young children in this way. And this is just a modest, very modest effort, uh, but it really needs to be done in a much more expanded way. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna actually skip this next section because we'll have time to go through it more during the week. And I want to uh, make sure we have time to review issues that are unique to the Tibetan situation. So with your permission, I'm going to really s just skip this. Um, and uh, this is a study that was published uh, several years ago, an epidemiological survey of alcohol use disorders in a Tibetan population. Uh, and this is from a group of scientists who are in China um, uh, who have been studying this issue. And uh, this was a survey done of approximately 5,000 uh, Tibetans who are living in the Lhasa region. Not, not all in the city, many uh, else outside the city. Um, a broad distribution of the population. And um, what they found is that alcohol use disorder, and I'll explain how that's measured in just a moment, but alcohol use disorder was found to occur in about 9.5% of females and 31% of males. Mm. By comparison, using the identical measure in the United States, these are the percentages. Um, females, about 5%, and males, about 12.5%. So a, a, a much larger... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so the measure that was used to, to determine alcohol use disorder includes questions like this. How often do you have six or more drinks on one occasion? And those who report alcohol use disorder are reporting 
having six or more drinks weekly or daily, or almost daily. Um, during the past year, how often have you failed to do what was normally expected of you because of your drinking? And again, those who have alcohol use disorders report this weekly or daily or almost daily. Uh, other items, have you been unable to remember what happened the night before because you were drinking? Again, same pattern. And finally, have you or someone else been injured as a result of your drinking? So these are um, fairly significant uh, impairments in everyday life that are being represented in this metric. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is um, certainly an issue that uh, hopefully we'll come back to and uh, um, may our efforts during this meeting be of some benefit to the Tibetan community um, uh, in this uh, area. Now one of the other interesting things is since the Tibetans are a relatively um, isolated group. Uh, uh, there are some interesting genetic issues which are being examined in modern science today. And this was a paper published in a very important journal in 2009 um, showing that there are very specific genes that are um, been identified uh, in Tibetan communities that some of the genes confer additional risk. They're genes that involve the metabolism of alcohol in the liver. Uh, and they increase the likelihood that the same amount of alcohol will have a more severe impact on the individual. Other genes are resilience genes. They actually protect the person. So it's, it's a complicated combination. But it, it, the, I just present this to illustrate that this is now a vibrant area of research in the Tibetan population that is now being done by scientists, um, mostly in China, with collaborations from uh, uh, scientists elsewhere in the world. So I want to end now with just a series of questions that will be the questions that I think we'll be pursuing as we go through our week together. Um, to what degree are drug addictions and other forms of addiction similar? Uh, Diana talked about our addiction to oil, uh, our addiction to consumption. To what extent is that similar to the more um, classic forms of drug addiction? And there's some evidence, even from neuroscience, to suggest that they actually share similar brain circuits. What are the predisposing factors that increase the uh, person's likelihood of developing an addiction? We're all, again, similar, but we're also different. And some individuals have a much greater likelihood of developing this than others. And can we learn something from that? How should the issue of free will be considered in relation to addiction uh, in light of the evidence that there are impairments in regulatory systems in the brain which clearly play some role in what we normally th think about as free will. And then are there preventative strategies that can be implemented early in life to minimize the likelihood of later problems? Can we teach self-control to young children? And does training in secular ethics in young children decrease the likelihood of subsequent addictive disorders? And I think this is an area where we as a society have a moral responsibility to, to, to act um, because there, there is now more and more evidence to suggest that this early intervention could make a really important difference. And finally, what specific contemplative practices might serve as an antidote to specific aspects of addiction or the antecedents of addiction? Uh, and so this is something that uh, I, I think the contemplatives will help us to understand as we go along. So these are the questions that um, we'll be addressing. And uh, thank you again, Your Holiness, for all of your uh, kind consideration and your inspiration.
Yes. Yes. Your Holiness, thank you so much for hosting this, the 27th Mind and Life Dialogue. We've done this now for many years. We thought it would be appropriate if you'd like to begin to open this session on craving, desire, and addiction with a few words of your own, and then I will follow on your good example. Craving, desire, and addiction. Addiction. Krasu, inji matching di di jungle jarbe, jarbe. His Holiness is asking how the monastics who don't follow in Tibetan. What do you mean? Tibetan monastics. That's joke. Congratulations. At the beginning, one mistake. Very good. You'll end up translating Jimpa. Oh, oh. You'll end up translating him. Instead of <laughs> <laughs> As uh, Chairman has uh, mentioned, uh, this is to the seventh meeting. Uh, At the beginning, I think almost now 30 years ago, uh, when we start that, I think mainly uh, my own auto curiosity uh, and some of uh, the scientists also, I think mainly out of curiosity. Uh, so meeting uh, between strangers to Tibet in this stage. <laughs> you also, I think, Dalai Lama, <laughs> mis mysterious person <laughs> from, from mysterious land. <laughs> <laughs> then once we sat and talk, then we know each other. Oh, same human being. Yeah. Mentally, emotionally, physically. And then, I think on top of that, I think scientist side and my side, we all science immense on our city contribution. contribution. And then uh, through technology, uh, our life, generally speaking, become much easier, much comfortable, wonderful. And also in the medical field, to research, there's been a lot of sort of the new. Discoveries, no? new discoveries, and so it become easier to tackle certain disease, illness like that. Wonderful. Uh, now they, there are a lot of problems about uh, due to too much sort of emotions. Uh, we call destructive emotions. So that. Even uh, medical science or health health point oh. point of view, and the healthy society, peaceful family, happy family, happy individual, ultimately a little bit emotion or mind. Uh, so, uh, in order to deal these problems, mainly created by uh, negative emotion, uh, firstly we should have knowledge, fuller knowledge, about the function of these different emotions and its own sort of the kind of laws. Uh, oh, ah. Its own laws. Oh, like that. Uh, so through our joint sort of effort, uh, how, to, uh, how to make a contribution. Firstly, happier individual. Through that way, happier family and happier community or society. Through that way, our final aim is happier now seven billion human beings. Certainly, this problem, much problem, our own creation. And uh, 
and here weapons also I think uh, one sort of major factor to create more killing, more violence. Uh, so, like America, there's a lot of talk about gun control. Uh, that means, you see, people consider uh, gun available somewhere on this planet. So then, uh, uh, with this spirit, you see, we carry this sort of dialogue. And then eventually, the dialogue becoming more serious and also eventually institutionalized. I think particularly the 26th meeting my way in South India. I think really, uh, I think creates Kasota. I think very strong positive impact in, in thousands of young monk students. And some scientists also have got some kind of impression, isn't it? Even it's true. Our, dis our discussion, yeah. you see, do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? Uh, so now I want you see, to tell the, I think, those new Kasuda, uh, Kasuda person, the attendees. Uh, attendees, all. The, uh, this kind of meeting is to two purposes. One purpose is, uh, extend our knowledge. Uh, I think as far as matter is concerned, particle is concerned, Western or say modern science highly developed. Their knowledge is really incredible. So very useful for us to learn from their knowledge, uh, their finding through experiment. Then the uh, Western scientist about the mind, about the emotion. There is a big sort of contrast. Their knowledge about matter, very high. Advanced. Their knowledge about mind, not that much. <laughs> <laughs> if may I say so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you see, uh, uh, our sort of varsity, uh, our, our dialogue is mutual benefit in the, in the field of knowledge. So this is one purpose. Uh, then another sort of purpose is uh, from our knowledge. Now, now today, on our planet, uh, I think f for physical comfort, the, uh, you see, some sort of sense of concern about humanity, about future of humanity. So you have your own sort of profession field, that is science, modern science. Uh, of course, I cannot describe myself something profession, but just a student of Buddhism in general, and particularly the Nalanda tradition. So, and then suddenly, as a Buddhist practitioner, every morning we pray entire sentient benefit for happiness for entire sentient being. So, so naturally, if you're serious about this prayer, then. Uh, Descendant being on uh, different galaxies, far away from, from us, we cannot do anything. Or directly or indirectly, nothing can be done. But at least on this planet, you see, we have there is some connection. And also, you see, we ourselves, the part of the uh, then six billion human beings. So if you really uh, sort of praying or sort of say they develop some kind of sense of concern of all sentient beings, then let us uh, think seriously 
about six billion human beings, understand it. So then, the, in our tradition, a lot of explanation about emotion. And also, we ourselves practice the method uh, when we develop certain negative emotion, how to tackle these things. So then, the, the very purpose of sort of scientific research also, you see, uh, uh, in, in one way, of course, try to find reality. Uh, for what purpose? Not necessarily, because of just because of the... For the sake of knowledge. Uh, sick knowledge. But also, you see, uh, the, these people also, you see, uh, through their research, how we can get some benefit to be human being. So different way of approach. But mainly, it's all, let's say, some sort of sense of concern, of well-being, of violence. You see, more because of that. Easily. Uh, easily. Oh. So then, uh, from deeper way, uh, if you think, real gun, real gun control is here. Here, uh, less anger, less hatred. Uh, then, the gun uh, becomes like ornament, right? Not really. Uh, no danger. Uh, but so long, here, the negative, violent emotion there, even without gun, uh, you can you can do or stone. I think always, <laughs> I think we cannot you cannot control or stone <laughs> always available <laughs> or some brick ray always <laughs> sort of available. <laughs> even you see this kazati nails nails. <laughs> 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 that that is you see when I was young uh, when I fighting with my elder brother, my main weapon is nail. <laughs> 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 so some injuries on his face, <laughs> really. <laughs> so therefore, real ultimately, gun control. Yeah. Uh, so that does not mean uh, some some serious operation here Such and uh, some sort of part of brain removed. Not that way. <laughs> but you see, through training of mind. And eventually, you see these uh, sort of, uh, violent sort of emotion reduce uh, to uh, to increase the positive emotion. That's that's possible. Uh, not necessarily be a religious person, even without belief. It's simply, the daily life happier when emotion develop. Uh, once you see, know some, the, uh, some way to deal this uh, negative emotion, if if person knows, then when about this destructive emotion come, and all the method within his own his or her own hand. So, so that's one of our purpose. One of the purpose. One purpose extend our knowledge about external world, internal world. Another thing, uh, 